welcome one and all. Um, so welcome to the Herzog Fox and Herman webinar on Israel at War. Um, a month ago, all our lives changed. For some, the change is related to an irrecoverable loss of family, of friends, of towns and villages, of homes. And for all of us, it is a change related to a loss of a dream, a dream of peaceful resolution of some of our conflicts with our neighbors, or perhaps a loss of innocence, the innocence of believing that we can make the world a better place just by hoping it will be one. A month into the war, we decided that it's time to share with our friends and colleagues what has in fact changed in Israel over the last month. And perhaps more importantly, what has not changed, what has remained the same. My name is Daniel Reisner. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I head Herzog's International Law, International Trade and National Security Department. But for the purpose of this presentation, my past is no less important than my present. I spent 20 years as an Israeli military officer. 10 of those years, I headed the International Law Department of the IDF. And I spent 20 years of my life as the Israeli government's peace negotiator and draft of peace agreements. So a total of 30 years, because some of them were parallel, I moved between war and peace on a daily basis. Perhaps an ironic uh aspect of that is that two days ago, my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. And we celebrated it by watching our wedding video at home with our three boys. And we then remembered that invitations to our wedding included the pri then Prime Minister, the young Benjamin Netanyahu, the Chief of Staff, Shaul Mofaz, and one Yasser Arafat the head of the PLO, with whom I've been negotiating for years. But those are those days, and today we are in a different reality, and the weddings look different. And I'm pleased to tell you that I'm here with three of my favorite colleagues, and our goal here is today to tell you what happened, what is happening, and what we think may happen in the future. I would like to present my wonderful managing partner, Gil White, who in a moment will share with you the Herzog perspective of the war. Our incredible head of the Employment and Labor Department, Oli Jerby, who will be here to field any and all questions relating to what to do as a result of this war. And my longtime friend, uh, Dr. Roy Scheindorf, a recent acquisition of our, friend, of our firm who now heads our International Dispute Resolution Practice Group, and until a year ago was the Deputy Attorney General of the State of Israel for International Law. And with that, I will hand over to my friend Gil Herzog at war. Thanks, Daniel. Um, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. I know we have people um, all over the globe. Um, firstly, thank you for joining us and taking some time. Thank you also just having flicked through the list of people on the Zoom. Uh, thank you all for the messages of support through every different media we can think of. Not just messages of support, many of you have actually done things to support. Uh, messages of support are helpful as well. Um, and that has, been, that has been more heartwarming than many of you can think in what is a um, strange and difficult reality that this wonderful country finds itself in. Um, the purpose of this session is to talk about facts. Um, you've all seen videos. You've all seen the atrocities committed by Hamas on that fateful 7th of October. Um, we will, for the purpose of this session, leave those aside and try and give you a snapshot as to what is going on. Um, so I find myself managing partner of a law firm of 750 employees, 96 as of today, who have been called up for reserve duty. 80-something of those are from the legal staff. 13 of them are partners. Um, each one of them is in our thoughts every day of the week. 15 members of our staff lost 
close family members. Three of them, two lost, um, two lost a brother, one lost a sister. Um, one who lost us, a brother, is our partner, El Neman. The brother she lost was the son of our founding partner, Yaakov Neman. Um, we have two lawyers in, who were injured in combat. One of those lawyers, a trainee here, is the grandson of Yaakov Neman, a nephew of Yale. Um, just as an anecdote, the other lawyer who was injured in combat in the first week um, was injured by a missile thrown by Hezbollah on the north, um, the border of Lebanon. He was injured, badly injured in his leg. A rescue team came, called a helicopter to um, to helicopter him to hospital in Haifa. One of the members of the rescue squad uh, was a partner in the same department as the injured lawyer. So this this comes at us from every from every direction uh, from every direction we can think of. Um, as Daniel said, this is all personal. This is a small country. 1,400 people killed and slaughtered on a day is however many times 9-11. And I sit here as managing partner of this law firm. I have a I have three children. My middle daughter is an officer in one of the army bases on the border of Gaza, one of the army bases that was overrun by Hamas on the 7th of October. Thankfully, my daughter was sleeping in her bed at home that day. My youngest daughter is enlisting in the army next year. She is in a pre-military program in a kibbutz called Alumin, one of the kibbutzim on the border of Gaza. My youngest daughter was sleeping in her bed at home that day. My oldest son, who finished his army service a year ago, was called up for reserve military duty. He is in one of the special units of the paratroopers and he is on the border of Lebanon in the south, in the north. So in addition to my 750 employees who I have to deal with on a daily basis, my family has been through a, a, an interesting period, but um, my children are safe and well, and we pray for all our other soldiers. We also have one of the relatives, one of our relatives, uh, one of the relatives of one of the office members is one of the 241 hostages who were taken by Hamas into Gaza. 241 or 1,400 victims. These are big numbers. It's difficult to see the individual stories behind each of those numbers, but that is what we need to do because each of the people who were killed and each of the people hostages in Gaza, each one of them is an entire world. But what do we do? So for the first two weeks after October 7, the country was in turmoil. The country was in shock. We are all still in shock. The most important and sought after commodity in this country today is psychologists. So if anyone has family members who are psychologists who want to come to Israel for a few months, they'll be well treated and well looked after. Um, but after those first two weeks, we realized that the key part of this war is the economy, is making sure that this incredible country with its startup nation economy, one of the fastest growing G GDPs in the OECD, continues to function. And we do now have a fully functioning office, even with 96 people on reserve duty. I try every day to speak to message some of those who are on the front line from the office they respond to me when they come out of Gaza when they come out of their tanks when they do whatever the first question they ask me is so what's going on in the office are people working are people in the office um and so we are here we're functioning it's actually quite nice to be here all together um and that is where we are at so again thank you all for your time and I will pass the virtual microphone back to Daniel Thank you very much, Gil. And, and thank you all for joining us. Before I start, uh, three logistical comments. Uh, first, uh, I, the plan is, obviously, not sure if we'll make it, 
to speak for about 45 to 50 minutes and give about 10 minutes for questions. As there are several hundred of you, we won't be able to answer all your questions, so I apologize in advance. Secondly, put all your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, uh, we have a team which will be reviewing the Q&A box and will be preparing the question for the appropriate person to respond. And finally, in the hopefully highly unlikely possibility that there will be a rocket siren while we are uh, going through this process, we apologize in advance. All of us are in the same building. We will all leave, go to a safe room for a few minutes and come back. Uh, we've talked to our friends in Hamas and we've tried to coordinate it and they won't do it, but no guarantee. So with this in mind, I would like to quickly make sure that we are all on the same page. And the first thing I want to make sure that we all understand is how did we get into this mess? What is Gaza? Most people speak about Gaza, have obviously never been there, but 99% also don't understand what Gaza is. So let me take you back in time. The Ottoman Empire ruled this part of the world for 400 years until 1917. And on this map, you can see the boundaries of the Ottoman Empire, which obviously included everything which is now Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, whatever you want to call it, all of it was part of the Ottoman Empire. And then World War I happened, and the victors of World War I, in this specific case, the English and the French, divided up the territories between them. The French took the territories we now call Syria and Lebanon, and the British, they took Iraq and Transjordan and Palestine and a few other places under their control. And then over the next 25, 30 years, there was a gradual process of what we call decolonial, decolonialization, difficult word to pronounce, which resulted in new states emerging in this region. Egypt in 1922 got its original nominal independence from England. Saudi Arabia and Iraq received independence from Britain in 1932. In 1943, the Le uh, Lebanon was established for the first time in history by the French, followed quickly three years later by Syria in 46 and Transjordan. And in 1948, the Jewish state of Israel joined the region. In fact, the only other change happened 30, in 1952 when Egypt actually really attained independence from Britain when there was the revolt of the officers. So theoretically, all of the Middle East was divided by the 1940s, except that isn't true. Because if we take a look at this map of Israel in 1948, you can see that two plots of land, what we now call the West Bank and what we call the Gaza Strip, were not part of Israel, were not part of Jordan, were not part of Syria, were not part of Lebanon, and were not part of Egypt. They were left outside these divisions. But there were people living in these areas, and I want to focus on the southern plot of land, the little blue blob between Israel and Egypt, which is the Gaza Strip. Between 1948 and 1967, the Gaza Strip was controlled by Egypt. The Egyptians didn't want it, so they imposed a military government over it until they could come up with a solution. We, I think, in retrospect, perhaps mistakenly, solved the problem for them in 1967 when we took over this territory and we controlled it until 2005 when we left. And from 2006 or 2007 onwards, depending on what day you choose, this territory is controlled by an organization called Hamas to this day. What is Hamas? Hamas is an Islamic military movement established in 1987 some say with Israeli support to create a counterbalance for the Fatah and the PLO. It is designated as a terrorist organization in most of the Western world, US it's from 1995, Canada from 2002. The numbers for the European Union are, the first one is when the military wing of Hamas was designated, the second one when all of Hamas was designated, and the third when the designation was approved by the European Court of Justice. And in the UK again, the military arm was designated in 01, and all of Hamas was designated two years ago. They took over the Gaza Strip following the fact that they won the elections 
for the Palestinian parliament in January 2006, and then they killed all of the Fatah people in Gaza and took over physically in 2007, have remained in power ever since, obviously no elections anymore. They claim to have around 40,000 fighters and they manufacture their own weapons. And the primary funder for the last several years, in addition to a country called Qatar, is Iran, which estimate, it is estimated gives them about a third of a billion dollars every year for the earth. And if we needed any proof of Hamas's intentions, we saw them a month ago, but all you need to do is to read the Hamas covenant where they make it very clear that the only solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be when all each and every one of us will be dead. So what happened on October 7th? And as Gil said, I know you all know, so I'm going to do this very quickly. And I want to make it clear, I won't be showing any of the problematics videos, etc. This is not this kind of webinar. This is a map showing you the areas which Hamas attacked on October 7th. This is a map showing you the specific locations where Israelis were killed and attacked. In addition to launching this incredible human wave attack, they also fired 4,301 rockets at Israel to keep our heads down at the same time. And here you have a, a, a table showing you the number of rockets being fired and you can see the numbers dwindling. You can assume it's the fact that A, the number of available rockets is going down, B, we're knocking them down as fast as we can, and C, Israeli forces are inside Gaza, so they have other things to do. But they succeeded incredibly well. And these are just some of the iconic pictures showing Hamas terrorists inside Israel, capturing a tank, entering kibbutzim, entering villages, shooting at civilians. And this is the aftermath. These are pictures from civilian houses who were visited by these terrorists and who committed atrocities I won't even mention. These are pictures from the famous music festival where over 250 young people lost their lives when they were collectively shot and killed just because they were celebrating life. And of course we have the kidnapped, the hostages, the people taken, children, the elderly, men, women, soldiers, civilians. And this is what was left. And the pictures were so bad that the soldiers couldn't hold and neither could the first responders. And in fact, everything that was left were primarily were bodies. And the numbers are crazy. Over 1,400 killed, of them over 1,000 civilians. And as many people remind us, this is the largest number, the highest number of Jews killed in the same day since World War II and the Holocaust. Five, over 5,000 injured. The current number again is 242 hostages and we still have 32 missing people who may be dead, who may be hostages, we just don't know yet. Now, I teach at university comparative counterterrorism approaches. And of course, in my class, I dedicate a lot of time to this attack. 9-11, approximately 3,000 people killed in the two strikes at the Twin Towers, and obviously many others died later. However, when you compare the number of dead people from October 7th and you compare the ratio of the population of the two countries, so October 7th was 13 and a half times the size of November 11, plus the fact that no one is reporting on that currently in Israel there are more than 250,000 Israeli refugees who have had to flee their homes and towns and villages, and don't know when and if they'll be able to return and to what. Now, what really happened on October 7th is also related to this picture. Because in spite of the fact that we've been shouting this for years, and most of the world has preferred not to listen, the real force behind almost everything which is happening right now is this country, Iran. 
which has created proxy armies in each one of these locations. And here's a slide showing each proxy army in each location. And when I talk to my friends in government and ask them why this timing of the Hamas attack, they said it was a compilation of opportunity, but also the fact that for Iran, it was important to derail, for example, the Israeli-Saudi peace talks. So you should not look at the Hamas attacks as something totally independent of the wider picture of the Iranian-Israeli war. In fact, it is in many respects a significant event within that. And I can exemplify this by the fact that we now know that the Hamas leaders were sitting in Iran both before and after the attack. And at least according to the New York Times, many of the people who attacked us trained in Tehran for that attack three weeks before the attack. So what happened after October 7th? First of all, we encountered a situation we have never encountered before. Over 240 Israelis, mostly civilians, but some of them soldiers, in the hands of these barbarians. And we had a lot of funerals in the office, in my streets, our friends, our families. But we're all mobilized. And the mobilization is unique for the last 50 years. But the biggest mobilization of all, of all has been of the Israeli civilian population. Incredible initiatives, money and equipment for soldiers, uh, 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 surrounding and providing everything required for the families of the kidnapped. Israel has proven, the Israeli people have proven themselves united and with more initiative than anyone could ever imagine. The support from our international friends has also been overwhelming as world leaders came to Israel to show their unity with us and understanding of the tragedy and of the consequences. And perhaps most of all, the US, which for the first time in our history has sent two aircraft carrier groups with a clear statement that they intend to use them if anyone wants to escalate the war into a regional war. Right? We created a coalition government, which many Israelis have been waiting for, for for over a year. And we launched a ground offensive, which is currently ongoing. And some of our colleagues and partners are actually fighting in Gaza as we speak. But as Roy will explain in a minute, while we are fighting barbarians, we are not barbarians. So even when we fight, for example, in compliance with international requirements, we provide advanced notice of our attacks to the civilian population. These are pictures of us dropping tens of thousands of flyers in Arabic, where you can see, warning the population that we're coming and you have to run away so that you don't get injured. Now, Hamas has been trying to stop these people from fleeing because they want them to be in the line of fire. You know who else wanted us to stop dropping these leaflets? The United Nations General Assembly, which on October 27 came out with a resolution calling Israel to take back its warning to the Gaza residents to flee from the combat zone. The West Bank is also on the verge of exploding as Hamas is trying to generate sympathy and support from other regions. We managed to recover four hostages. Two were returned, uh, 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 three hostages, two, no, four. And one was discovered by us. But Hamas has been using the hostages in propaganda videos to show the situation. We have seen huge support for Israel, primarily for the hostages all over the world. But we're seeing a resurgence of anti-Semitism, the likes of which we have not seen since Nazi Germany. But not in Germany, but in England, in France, in Italy, in the United States, and in the United States University. Amazon UK was selling this t-shirt, which has become the rallying cry 
for, for the Palestinian cause. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. This is a call for genocide. I'm glad to say that our friends in Amazon have since then dropped all of this line from all of their websites. But in all of this disaster, there's also some light. Oh, sorry, I forgot this. They attempted lynch on Israeli plane when they landed in Dagestan, a former Soviet Republic. But this is a letter which went out a few days ago from, I think, 178 leading US law firms. Gil, I believe you were involved in this. Can you tell us a bit about this? Um, so one of the, there will be many issues that the Jewish world, I think, has tolerated over the recent years. And one of them has been the rise in anti-Semitism emanating particularly from US academic institutions. Um, which we have always seen as a not just a stain on an ongoing basis, but potentially educating future generations of leaders of the U.S. economy, U.S. politics, um, and a small spark was lit by two or three U.S. law firms in discussions, um, and the initial letter came out with something like forty firms. Um, as of last night, it was actually one hundred and seventy-seven firms signed on this letter I understand more and more are signing up so kudos to all of you who are on this webinar whose firms um, signed up to this and there are many many other initiatives that the Jewish world and particularly the philanthropic part of the Jewish world is undertaking now uh, to try and change the mindset of the US universities and this was a, a, a I think a groundbreaking moment. Thank you Gil. Hamas has been trying to win the media war. These are pictures of a hospital in Gaza which they claim that we bombed. Thankfully, uh, the world became normal again when it was realized that it wasn't us, it was them. And the world accepted it. But the fact is that they are using hospitals as military bases. And this is the map of Shifa Hospital, which Actually, underneath it is one of the major uh, command and control centers of all of the Hamas in Gaza. And as you may have heard on the media, the IDF is now surrounding Shifa Hospital in its vicinity. And of course, this could become a big issue, which leads me to ask the question, how can we fight this fight when we want still to be human beings and not be barbarians? And this leads me to giving the baton to my friend, Roy Shandorf. Roy, let's talk a bit about the legal questions which arise in this type of conflict. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Uh, Daniel presented uh, a lot of the factual background, and I will just say a few words uh, about, the, the, about some of the legal aspects uh, that come up. So... As all of you surely know, this uh, situation, situation of wars, is regulated by the laws of war. The laws of war is one of the oldest chapters in the international law. What it tries to do is balance in, uh, um, in, in some way between the military needs and the considerations of, uh, of humanity. Uh, one thing about the laws of war is that there are no exemptions to one party when the other side uh, violates, uh, even if the other side violates intentionally. So the fact that uh, Hamas uh, has violated almost every single requirement under the laws of war does not absolve us as Israelis from, uh, uh, from these requirements. It creates a very difficult result that one side uh, is expected to to, compl to comply with the standards. Uh, the other side is is violating them uh, and even using them to to take or takes advantage of the rules to uh, promote uh, its its own uh, goals. But still, that doesn't uh, change the commitment of Israel to act in accordance with the laws of war. A few words about the actions of uh, Hamas. Daniel described some of the uh, atrocities committed by Hamas, murder, rape, mutilation of bodies, torture, 
kidnapping. There isn't uh, almost a single uh, offense uh, or crime under international law that was not committed uh, by uh, Hamas. And these crimes uh, clearly amount to war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even uh, some of the crimes could uh, rise to the level of, uh, of genocide. We know that there are investigations at the moment in a number of uh, uh, countries, uh, criminal investigations, uh, most notably Germany, and I believe that also in France and in the United Kingdom, and I'm quite convinced that these will lead eventually to uh, uh, criminal proceedings. We also understand that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court is looking into uh, what has happened of, on October 7th. He announced uh, uh, already in his uh, visit to Cairo that he's uh, investigating these uh, issues and that could lead also to proceeding in the ICC. Yesterday, the Attorney General of Israel announced uh, uh, that an effort on in Israel to collect uh, to collect the evidence and bring to justice uh, all uh, those that were involved and were not killed uh, uh, during the hostilities. We hold uh, a number of the perpetrators and I'm sure they will be uh, brought to justice in Israel. It should be noted though that, you know, from the Hamas perspective, the legal response is not, uh, is not extremely effective, right? Hamas doesn't really care about uh, uh, the law, as Daniel said, it is, recognized as a terrorist organization throughout the world. Um, and the uh, Hamas uh, commanders, they don't travel in the Western world. So so the legal response is not necessarily going to be effective in, in uh, capturing uh, uh, some of those uh, Hamas operatives. It may have some impact on, the, on Hamas leaders that uh, currently are located in Qatar or uh, were located in uh, Turkey at some uh, um, at, at some point, uh, and those, of course, that are held in, in Israel will be uh, will be prosecuted by the Israeli authorities. A few words about Israel's uh, uh, response. So, as I said, uh, there is a, a clear commitment of the Israeli government uh, uh, to act in accordance with the uh, rules of international law, particularly the, the laws of war. Um, and this is, as, as I said, in the face of intentional uh, violations uh, uh, by uh, Hamas and uh, the fact that Hamas is doing everything it can to make it more difficult for us to, uh, uh, to act in accordance with the law by uh, mingling or by uh, getting its uh, civilian population uh, or hiding behind its civilian populations in its military uh, operations. I will just highlight some of the issues that uh, uh, that come up, some of the legal issues that come up in the context of these operations. Uh, the first issue is the issue of self-defense, whether Israel has the right to take the action that it is taking in the in the, the Gaza Strip. I think it it can hardly be doubted that Israel has a right uh, uh, to respond to what has happened on uh, October 7. Uh, um, and uh, uh, I, I don't think that many would doubt it. There are technical questions about uh, whether uh, the, the law of, the law of self-defense applies or it's part of an ongoing uh, conflict, but they're not important uh, in, in terms of the, I think, overwhelming consensus that Israel uh, has the right to respond. The next uh, issue that comes up is uh, what is known as the principle of distinction in the laws of war. Uh, the basic principle in the laws of war that you can only target, you can only target your operations at military targets and at combatants, and you are not allowed to target civilians or uh, civilian objects. Now, Israel clearly uh, makes every effort to, to do that. But it is very difficult when the uh, military infrastructure of Hamas is so interwined with the uh, with uh, is with or is part of civilian objects, and we've seen uh, uh, also in this conflict, but in past conflicts as well, Hamas hiding its uh, military assets uh, within schools, within hospitals, within uh, a, a private dwellings of individuals, uh, or puts it tunnels uh, underneath the, 
uh, densely populated uh, area or densely built area and dismantling this infrastructure uh, uh, sometimes involves uh, uh, also unavoidable harm to, uh, uh, to, to things that appear to be uh, civilian. The, uh, uh, the next point is, is about proportionality and uh, in the laws of words, the proportionality principle doesn't mean what many people think that, you know, if uh, Hamas killed the 1400 Israelis, so Israel can only kill 1400 uh, uh, Palestinians in the, uh, or Hamas operatives in the context of its uh, war. That's clearly what the principle, not what the principle of proportionality says. The principle of proportionality says that when you uh, attack a military target, a specific military target, you need to assess whether the military advantage that you gain by targeting that military target is, uh, is uh, um, or, or the, the other way, whether the civilian, uh, the damage to civilians and civilian objects uh, is not excessive in comparison to the, the military advantage. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to compare uh, civilian damage to military advantage. Uh, but one thing that can be said is that clearly the uh, military advantage, now, after what we have seen in on October 7, it is clear that the military advantage in dismantling uh, uh, Hamas assets is much more significant than what uh, perhaps was assessed uh, was assessed uh, before. Um, another principle in the laws of war is the the uh, principle that requires to take precautions in attack or to take steps to mitigate harm to the civilian population. Daniel mentioned the uh, the efforts by Israel to uh, advise people to move uh, from. Uh, uh, the areas of uh, hostilities or of intense hostilities to safer zones. I think Israel is, is doing many efforts in these regards. Uh, Daniel mentioned the leaflets. There are also phone calls that are being made um, and calls on the, uh, on the Palestinian media and, uh, and websites. Uh, uh, unfortunately, Hamas is making every effort to prevent people from moving to, um, to safer zo zones. Uh, um, but Israel continues to make uh, these efforts, even deploying tanks and uh, and soldiers to actually protect the people as they move to the south. Uh, the last point is that comes up also in the media is, is the issue of humanitarian assistance. Uh, Israel clearly has no interest in, in creating a, a, a humanitarian crisis in the Gaza Strip. It will not uh, further in any way uh, in Israeli goals or uh, interests. Under the laws of war, there is no obligation for a country to provide any assistance to its uh, to its uh, enemies. The only obligation that exists is not to prevent others that want to transfer humanitarian assistance, uh, not prevent them from doing so, but with the condition that uh, steps need to be taken to guarantee uh, that the humanitarian assistance actually gets to the popu civilian population and doesn't or is, and is not used to support the military efforts of the other side. Unfortunately, what we have seen already is that some of the humanitarian assistance that is uh, provided now to Gaza is actually being exploited by Hamas. And that is a, that, uh, that is a real a, a concern. Hopefully, there will be a way to uh, uh, prevent Hamas from taking advantage of uh, Israeli willingness to allow the transfer of humanitarian assistance uh, so that we can continue and, uh, and provide uh, the kind of support that is needed for the, uh, uh, for the Palestinian population. It, it is important to say that the humanitarian situation in, in Gaza is monitored by a, 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 an office in the Israeli government, uh, it's called Kogat, and uh, uh, currently it, it, it is, at least on, on the information available, it is known that there is enough uh, uh, water, food, uh, and uh, even uh, um, um, fuel in, in the Gaza Strip for the needs of the uh, population. Uh, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roy. and. Um... 
I would like to spend a few minutes to talk about the now. Let's first of all talk about Israel's economy during the war. And as Gil said earlier, the first two weeks, we were in a state of shock. The economy was in a state of shock. The entire country was in a state of shock. Everything was closed for the first few days. We didn't know what to do. Uh, and as a result, of course, uh, 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 Moody said that they would consider downgrading us. The shekel slumped, uh, uh, slumped uh, uh, against the dollar and the pound and the, the euro, etc. But then two or three weeks later, the shekel recovered, the Israeli economy opened, and we moved into what we call emergency routine. Restaurants are open, stores are open, law firms are open, everything is open. And people are trying to find a new balance in what we all realize is going to be a very long war. And a very long war, which means when we go to work, we sometimes have to lie down on the street when, 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 when rockets are fired, and then we drive to the office and we work from our desks until the next siren is sounded. And I, the final part I want to talk about is the legal situation in Israel. This is where we actually encounter many of the clients who come in with questions about what's going on, what are the implications for us. So let me start by saying that Israel declared a state of war, which is something we hadn't done since the Yom Kippur War in 1973. And such a declaration is actually less important for the business world. It's more an international law related and constitutional related declaration. Um, but the interesting thing that similar to the US declaration of war 9-11, the Israeli government did not define the enemy. And this has created an interesting situation whereby it is no longer clear if Gaza is a legitimate trading partner anymore in Israel, because if Gaza is an enemy, then Israelis are not allowed to trade with it, banks are not allowed to transfer funds to it, etc. And no one has explained who the war is against. Is it against Hamas? Is it against Iran? Is it against Gaza? Is it against some part of the Palestinians? The government has been silent on this issue. So we can tell you that, for example, we have been advising our clients not to transfer funds to Gaza right now during the war and to wait until some clarity is reached about the fact what is and is not allowed under Israeli law. The second declaration is the, is the declaration called a special situation in the home front. Now, this has been declared quite often in the past because we've had a lot of rounds with the Palestinians and Hamas, but never at the current scope because currently the declaration covered the entire country. In the past, it was always related to the specific part of the country where the fighting was going on. The primary purpose of this declaration is to enable the army to give protective instructions to the populace. But this law actually triggers numerous other laws. Uh, for example, one of them, which uh, if you have questions, Orly, who is standing by, will be happy to explain, imposes a lot of limitations on what you are allowed to do with employees during such a situation. You can't fire, you can't terminate. Can, under what conditions can you put them on leave? All of these issues have special regimes in this type of situation. The same is true of companies which are designated as providers of essential services, because this law automatically triggers some rights and obligations on such companies. And the third declaration which is enforced in Israel is a declaration of a state of emergency. Now, actually, this has been enforced in Israel since 1948. So this is nothing new. And what it does is it empowers the government to bypass the parliament by legislating directly laws, re-laws, which can do almost anything. Now, this was used quite extensively during COVID because you had to legislate quickly and you didn't have time to go through the full parliamentary process. And it is being used now as well. And I can tell you that there are some very interesting new laws being put in place through this. Uh, the last one I was looking at was the law which empowers the Israeli army to access computers which can control cameras uh, uh, for the purpose of, get, of collecting evidence. So what we've shown you here is that Israel has gone through a process of adapting to this new reality, but at the core of things, we are now back to work. All of the country is back to work. 
All of us are back in the office. Those of us who are not fighting or enlisted, etc., have gone back to work. Schools are opening again under ever increasing uh, quotas. Universities are not opening yet. They've delayed the start to December. But generally speaking, Israel has geared up to a long war and we are very good at preparing for some situations once the shock and surprise wears off. And this is where we are right now. And with this, I want just to share with you some examples of common questions we faced over the last few weeks. Some of you may laugh, but a lot of companies, especially the multinationals, are asking us, Can we? should we allow our employees to come with weapons into the workplace? And the short answer is, this is not a good time to say no weapons in the workplace for most employers. Uh, in normal times, maybe that would work. Now it doesn't make much sense. And we have become experts at giving out specifications for safe and safety protocols and security protocols and discussing this with the police, etc., for our clients. What to do with called up employees? Uh, I, we have seen some really tough questions. I think the toughest question I heard only from one of your partners was a startup which is on the verge of going bankrupt, said one of our employees is a hostage in Gaza and his wife was killed. Do we need to pay a salary and to whom? I don't think anything prepared us for that question. Um, and of course, we're getting asked a lot of questions. Can the government do stuff to us? Can they access our computers? Can they take our records? Short answer is no, but our reputation precedes us. So everything th everyone thinks the Israeli security services have these magic wands that they can use, but they don't. And finally, of course, everyone is asking what type of compensation will there be? And the short answer is direct damages. You can, you can and should file re requests immediately because there are already laws in place which enable you to get that compensation. Indirect damage will take time. There are going to be several tiers of laws giving uh, compensation. The, the, the highest compensation will be for the kibbutzim and the, the towns which were hit by the attacks in the south and in the north. The second tier will be for the neighboring regions and the, the map which has been drawn up of the orange zone. And then the rest of the country will also get compensation for indirect damages, but wait a minute, it will take a few weeks for the picture to clear up and we, we once we figure out what we need to pay and how much money we have. And so I'll stop here. And I think it's time for us to field a few of our questions that we received. And I'm being fed them through the WhatsApp as I think are the others. Um, and with your permission, uh, uh, I think I'd like to start with uh, the question, Gil, which I think you would be best suited to answer. We asked, do you think law firms in the rest of the world should cut ties with anyone who should show support for Hamas and their firms like they did against Russia? So it's, a, it, it's an interesting question. I saw the question coming and been thinking about it. So I see the question twofold. I think one is a question which we faced often in Israel over the last month, which is employees of institute of any company, including law firms, um, who are um, blatantly coming out in support of Hamas or in support of the atrocities undertaken, and that uh, there is very short shrift for, particularly in Israel, but as we saw also with the letter to the deans of the US universities, seemingly less patience for that in the US today as well, but we're being asked those questions all the time, and again, Orly and the labor law department are, are, are fielding those questions. Um, I think that we have seen an outpouring of support for Israel, which we haven't seen before from many, many Western governments. Um, we have seen an ongoing uh, number of leaders from obviously President Biden, but through the UK and Germany and Austria and Greece and Cyprus and Hungary and many, many, many others who don't come to mind now, um, seeing the commander of the German army yesterday donating blood in an Israeli hospital for injured Israeli victims was, was as with many things, just heart-wrenching yesterday, particularly emotional. Uh, I think law firms and many law firms have, and I saw a couple sending in the chat, and believe me, we are seeing what all of you are doing. Um, and, and, and again, it warms our hearts. I think that this time, 
there is good and there is evil. There is nothing in between. Um, and therefore, you know, I think law firms should be seeing on which side of that particular axis they sit. Thank you, Gil. Oli, uh, uh, you've been very polite and uh, waiting. Uh, we've been asked questions about uh, uh, what impact will the current uh, events have on court proceedings? Will there be extensions or will will uh, things continue as is? Uh, maybe you could say a bit about what's happening in this context, because I know you're dealing with it. In the courts? Um, yes. So there are some instructions with respect to extensions. There were in the beginning, like you said, in the total shock. So there were a special instruction in postponing hearings. Um, many lawyers are in the military service. Uh, um, many other the spouses are there. So, you know, the kids are not uh, uh, are at home. So basically there were several extensions with respect to the dates, dates of submissions and hearings, et cetera. So at the moment, they are hearing only a urgent, uh, urgent cases. But we are being updated on it almost on a weekly basis. So let's wait and see. I think the more we are waiting, we see more and more, as you said, some kind, I won't say, of course, back to normal, but to the new routine uh, of uh, operating under this war situation. Thank you, Oli. And Roy, a question in, in, in our world. Uh, there's been a lot of noise about the lack of activity of the ICRC. And one of the people asking, is there any point for legal redress against the ICC for not doing more to help the Israeli hostages? What do you think? Well, I, I actually think that it's important to remember that the ICRC is not uh, it's not our enemy. And uh, in, in many ways, the ICRC has, uh, has the ability to, uh, to assist us. Um, and we need uh, those... Uh, organizations and uh, countries that have uh, the ability to put uh, pressure on uh, Hamas. So in my view, it's, it, it is useful to put pressure on the ICRC to do, uh, to do more, to do as much as, uh, as they can. But I, I, at least I, I don't think that we should go as far as uh, uh, completely distancing them from, uh, uh, from acting and, and fulfilling their responsibility to do uh, whatever they can to uh, to help us uh, get uh, get the hostages back uh, back home. Thank you, Roy. And I can see a lot of questions coming in, and but I am cognizant of the fact that when we said an hour, we actually meant an hour because, you know, we bill by the hour, so we're taking this seriously. Um, so with your permission, I will end this with my answering two questions which have come in. Uh, the first question is, uh, 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 does the government have a plan for the day after? Um, I think the short answer, the, the two short answer, A, they don't have a plan for today, let alone for the day after. So, so the answer is no. And secondly, I'm not sure what government you're talking about because I'm not 100% sure what the Israeli government will look like after the day after. Uh, we have a lot of internal discussions to go through once this war is over and which is our government and who will lead us is going to be one of those discussions. And the final question uh, uh, I think makes sense and thank you for this, For we got this from several people, what can we do to help? And so I, I will tell you two things that come to mind. A share the story with everyone you can. Explain to them what is going on. Not propaganda, tell them the fact, the good, the bad, the problematic, our mistakes, our failures, everything. But people need to know what's really going on because there's a lot of fake news and fake stories out there. And you are all potentially uh, 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 messengers of the truth. And that's why we are very thankful for you to joining us here today. And the second thing uh, is a request. Uh, send us work. Uh, nothing helps us more than feeding the 750 families at our firm and working in the office every day enables us to forget what's happening in other places and also helps us to ensure that the 90 plus people from our firm who are now doing more important stuff than legal work will have a place to come back to when the war ends. 
So with this and with 30 seconds to spare, on behalf of all of us, I would like to thank all of you for spending this hour with us and to share the hope with you that the next large scale webinar we will we'll do will be sometime in the future when we can discuss topics like uh, peace and uh, new business opportunities, etc. But I think we'll have to wait a bit until that happens. So thank you all everyone for joining. And have a peaceful day.